An exploding corpse, a fiery funeral, and a body that was abandoned twice by those charged with burying it, then disinterred at least three times and abused to the point of almost total destruction. It sounds like too much to have been suffered by just one individual, but only if you've never heard the disturbing tale of what happened to William the Conqueror's remains. So set down your food and hang on to your gag reflex, because by popular request, I'm going to tell you about the painful death, bursting boils, horrific post-mortem stench, and multiple exhumations and desecrations of William I, King of England. <laughs> Before we get gory, if you love history and want more of it, make sure to hit the subscribe button beneath the video and switch on notifications so you never miss an upload. For those of you who prefer a language other than English, there's also the option to switch on subtitles in almost any language of your choice, using the gear icon as shown on screen. Finally, you can find links to my social media and Patreon sites in the description box below. William the Conqueror is probably best known for the event which earned him that particular moniker, the conquest of England in 1066 after he defeated King Harold at the famous Battle of Hastings. This brought about the end of Anglo-Saxon rule in that country and introduced the royal family whose descendants still sit on the throne today. William, who was also the Duke of Normandy, then ruled his new dominion alongside his pre-existing French lands for the next 21 years. But in the summer of 1087, he fell gravely ill whilst campaigning in France. As is frequently the case with events this long ago, we have different versions of what happened from different sources. Orderic Vitalis, an English-born monk who lived most of his life in France, says only that the by now very overweight king, quote, fell sick from the excessive heat and his great fatigues, and after suffering severely for six weeks, first in Rouen, then in the Priory, so within the living quarters of the Church of Saint-Gervais, he died, aged 59, on the 9th of September. Now, Orderic was only born in 1075 and wrote his history of the events of the 1080s in about the 1130s. That's not ideal, as it's half a century after the king's death, and he wasn't an eyewitness to it, though he was living in France in 1087, as he left England aged only 10, but from his position in the monastery of saint evreux he'll have had access to earlier sources and histories which he could use to inform his own work, and he may well have spoken to people with first-hand knowledge of the Conqueror's demise. Still, we should take what he says with a pinch of salt, as his work has a clear religious and moral bent to it. This is particularly evident in his inclusion of lengthy speeches, supposedly made by William on his deathbed, which are almost certainly largely, if not entirely, imaginary, but which have William expire in a suitably royal and devout manner. I'm not going to run through them here, though, as we're interested in his body and not in things he probably never said. Other sources give us a bit more detail as to the cause of death. The Anglo-Norman chronicler, William of Malmesbury, gives two possible reasons. The first is that in the course of burning the town of Mont, William came too close to the flames, and the heat of it made him ill. The second, and in my opinion more likely option, is that he was so overweight that when his horse jumped a ditch, the king's abdomen was, quote, ruptured, because, quote, his belly projected over the front of the saddle. Malmesbury was born in about 1090 and lived in England his whole life, so again, he's not a perfect source as he wasn't contemporary, but like Orderic, his position as a monk likely gave him access to people and written sources which he could then use to construct his account of King William's death. There is another source which you might hear spoken of called the De Obitu Willemi, meaning about the death of William. Now at first glance, this seems to be the best as it was written nearest to the events it describes, having been dated to somewhere between the 1090s and the 1120s. However, closer analysis of the text has shown that it is in fact little more than a plagiarised blend of two 9th century sources describing the deaths of the historic figures Charlemagne and Louis the Pious, with only minimal changes to insert new people and place names and some dates. It has very little value as a source of information about William's death, and so I won't be looking at it any further. For all its drawbacks, the best, most detailed account we have for the events of September 1087 
is therefore Orderic Vitalis, and unless otherwise stated, it is his work which I'll be using for the rest of the discussion of the King's Corpse and Burial. Now, if you've been here for a while, you'll know that I already have a video on what happened to the body of Henry VIII's sixth wife, Catherine Parr, in which I said words to the effect of, I've never read a tale about a worse case of corpse desecration within English royalty. That's no longer true. I think William the Conqueror might have her beat, or at the very least, it's a photo finish. And unlike Catherine, the humiliations in his case seem to have started within minutes of his death. As soon as the king expired, those nobles who had been present panicked at the thought that their lands would be seized and immediately fled to secure their possessions. The servants they left behind in the residence then looted everything they could lay their hands on, including clothes, furniture, bed linens and weapons, before making a run for it themselves. William himself was left dead and nearly naked on the floor for many hours. The clergy and monks eventually processed to Saint-Gervais Church to commend his soul to God, and the Archbishop, also called William, ordered that the King slash Duke should be buried in the Abbey of St. Stephen in Caen, also known as the Abbey of St. Etienne, which the Conqueror had founded. There was no one to actually take care of the body and make this happen, however, until eventually a country knight by the name of Hurlewin, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, stepped up and made the funeral arrangements. At his own expense, he had the body embalmed and taken by boat and overland to Cam. When it arrived there, which was presumably days, if not a couple of weeks later, it was met by a man named Gilbert, which maybe should be pronounced Gilbert in French, who was the abbot of the church, and he and a large group of monks, clerks and laymen began to accompany it in solemn procession to the church. Then another disaster happened. A fire broke out in one of the houses in the town, and most of the attendants on the body ditched it and ran home to save what property they could and to help to extinguish the flames. Only the monks were left, who brought the body into the church whilst chanting psalms. Orderic then says that, quote, All the bishops and abbots of Normandy assembled to perform the obsequies of the illustrious duke, who was the father of his country. But he doesn't make it clear if this all took place on the same day as the fire or if some time had passed. Either way, they attended a funeral service for him, then attempted to bury William between the choir and the altar. This was easier said than done, though, for as he was about to be laid to rest, a man named Asselin, son of Arthur, made his way out of the crowd present and declared that the dead king's last duke had illegally seized from Arthur the land on which the church had been built and beneath which William was about to be interred. Asselin forbade the conqueror from being buried on ground which was his rightful inheritance, and his neighbours confirmed that he spoke the truth about its ownership. The bishops and nobles present hastily paid the man 60 shillings for the small piece of earth in which William was to be buried. William of Malmesbury actually says the conqueror's son, later Henry I, gave him £100 of silver and then they attempted to proceed with the funeral. Things were about to get much worse, though. It's not clear just how long King William had been deceased at this point, but I think it's fair to say he was pretty ripe by now, and the funeral arrangements had not been well organised. The body was on a bier, presumably wrapped up in hides, as Henry I would later be when he was buried in this exact same church, and you can see my video on his death and burial, by the way, to hear about how his body became so rotten that the pong may have killed a man. And although William did have a coffin, this was placed into the grave first, with the intention being that his body would then be lowered down into it. It was only at this point, with the body half in its grave, that it was discovered that said coffin wasn't long enough. Orderic tells us that, quote, some violence was used to try to force it in, but that because of the king's corpulence, quote, the boils burst, and an intolerable stench affected the bystanders and the rest of the crowd. The smoke of incense and other aromatics ascended in clouds, but failed to purify the tainted atmosphere. The priests therefore hurried the conclusion of the funeral service and retired as soon as possible in great alarm to their respective abodes. The whole thing had been a shambles from the minute William's body was abandoned by his own nobles and servants through to his poorly executed funeral, paid for by a stranger and beset by fire, legal disputes, and now an exploding corpse. 
Even Henry VIII, whose body may also have ruptured in its coffin, had more dignity in his last days above ground. I'll leave my video on Henry's corpse linked for you, by the way. Still, William's son, William II, aka William Rufus, made an attempt to smooth things over by having a memorial covered in gold, silver and precious stones erected over what he assumed would be his father's final resting place. It included a Latin epitaph in golden letters written by Thomas, Archbishop of York, and of which I've only been able to find the following rather flurry English translation. He that the sturdy Normans ruled, and over England reigned, and stoutly won and strongly kept what he so had obtained. And did the swords of those of man by force bring under awe, and made them under his command live subject to his law. This great King William lieth here, entombed in little grave. So great a lord, so small a house sufficeth him to have. When Phoebus in the virgin's lap his circled course applied, and twenty-three degrees had passed, even at that time he died. This is a complicated reference to his date of death. With the monument in place, the world moved on, and mostly forgot about the humiliating end of the once great conqueror. The problem with being dead famous, though, see what I did there, is that if people know where you're buried because you've got a big, ostentatious tomb over your head, some of them are going to want to dig you up out of morbid curiosity and or to steal pieces of you for fireplace ornaments. And that kind of total desecration is exactly what happened to William multiple times. Now, to be fair, William I actually got to lie in his tomb in Caen undisturbed for a really long time. 435 years, in fact, because it was only in 1522 that the grave was reopened. This was done at the behest of a visiting cardinal and archbishop who got permission from Peter de Martigny, Bishop of Castres, who was then also the Bishop of St. Stephen's. Having removed the cover stone, they found William's body, which was supposedly in excellent condition, and showed him to be unusually tall and still with scraps of red taffeta around him, which he was obviously buried in. They even had a painting commissioned of the Conqueror based on a view of his body, which you can see a copy of here. The original is long gone. He is dressed in this image in what was then modern clothing, which is why he looks so much like Henry VIII, just as people today use computer programs to try to show what historic figures would look like if they were alive now. If you've seen my aforementioned video on the body of Catherine Parr, or my offering on Charles I's corpse, you'll know that bodies which are quickly and expertly embalmed, then put into sealed lead coffins, can indeed stay in remarkable condition for literally centuries. However, the supposed state of preservation of William's body doesn't tally at all with Orderic Vitalis' description of him exploding, then being squashed into a stone sarcophagus, no lead, and this leads us to one of two conclusions. Either the body was not in as good condition in 1522 as was claimed, or it was not in such poor condition just before burial in 1087 as Orderic said. I'll let you be the judge. Also in the tomb was a copper plate with a long inscription in Old French which told of William's life and deeds. Their curiosity assuaged, the religious men had the conqueror reburied and off they went. This was just the start of a rough ride for William's bones though. A few decades later in 1562 and during the French Wars of Religion came a far worse desecration. The French writer Charles de Bourgville, who was from Caen and lived between 1504 and 1593, was present in the church when the desecration took place, and later wrote about it in a book published in 1588. He said that Huguenots, who were French Protestants, had first ransacked and largely burnt the church, destroying the magnificent sepulchre over William's grave and his stone effigy too. Then, a few days later, they struck the sarcophagus in which he lay with daggers, and when it made a hollow sound, they thought he might have been buried with treasure, which they could pillage. They therefore beat in the stone until they accessed the body, still wrapped in red taffeta, but discovered no treasure. De Bourgville himself gathered up the remains, which included jaw bones, teeth, and very long arms and legs, and gave them to a monk of the abbey called Father Michael Canel. He kept them in his room with the intention of reburying them when times were better, 
But when soldiers under the command of one Admiral Chastillon came to the town, the monks were made fugitives and virtually all the bones were lost. According to Charles de Bourgville, only one thigh bone was saved by the Viscount de Falaise and was more than four finger lengths longer than the thigh bone of a tall man. Another early-ish description of this episode may be found in a 1613 book by Sir John Hayward, though as you'll see, some of the details are a little different. He wrote that, in the year 1562, when Chastillon took the city of Caen with those broken troops that escaped at the Battle of Dreux, which took place on the 19th of December 1562, certain savage soldiers of divers nations, led by four dissolute captains, beat down the monument which King William his son, that's William Rufus, had built over him, and both curiously and richly adorned with gold and costly stones. Then they opened his tomb, and not finding the treasure which they expected, they threw forth his bones with very great derision and despite. Many English soldiers were then in the town, who were very curious to gather his bones, whereof some were afterwards brought into England. Hereby the report is convinced for Vian that his body was found uncorrupt, more than four hundred years after it was buried. Hereby also it is found to be false, that his body was eight foot in length, for neither were his bones proportionable to that stature, as it is testified by those who saw them, and it is otherwise reported of him by some who lived in his time, namely, that he was of a good stature, yet not exceeding the ordinary proportion of men. Whether English troops really stole some of the conqueror's bones, I can't tell you. De Bourgville, who was actually there, didn't mention it, and yet Hayward was only writing 50 years later and might have heard stories from some old English soldiers or their descendants about the goings-on in Caen in 1562. It's a story I've seen repeated in other later sources, who presumably got it from Hayward, but it's impossible to verify. As for that thigh bone that Viscount de Falaise got, apparently it stayed in his family until 1642, when his descendants returned it to the church for burial, and I'll be discussing it a little further in a minute. It was in 1642 that the monks at the abbey had this altar tomb to the conqueror built, the sides and ends of which were red and white speckled marble. Escutcheons on either end of it showed the three lions of England and the two lions of Normandy, and the original inscription was recreated on its south side. On its north side, however, the new Latin inscription, which you can see in this image, was added. Translated, it read, The sepulchre of the most victorious and merciful conqueror, William, whilst he lived King of England, Prince of Normandy and Main, the most pious founder of this abbey, being broke to pieces and thrown down by the frantic rage of the heretics in the year 1562, was at length rebuilt by the noble religious of this abbey, that means the monks, out of their pious sense of gratitude to the memory of so munificent a benefactor, in the year of our Lord, 1642, John de Bailhache being principal of the monastery. In 1742, this tomb was also removed and replaced with a simple black marble slab on the floor, which again repeated the original 1087 inscription and also added another, which explained how the original tomb had been destroyed, how the thigh bone had been saved and returned in 1642, and that it had now been moved to a crypt near the altar. The next problem to befall this unluckiest of tombs was the French Revolution. David Douglas stated in his biography of William that the marble slab I just described to you was destroyed by a mob in 1793, and later replaced by a 19th century stone. He didn't give a source for the revolutionary destruction though, nor have I been able to find one elsewhere, which is disappointing as I would have liked to have been able to double check the details myself. I would assume any such source is in French though, which is perhaps why I haven't been able to locate it. The thigh bone in the tomb was removed and examined in 1961, and on the basis of its size it was estimated that the person it belonged to was about 5 feet 10 inches in height though a 1983 examination reduced this to 5 feet 6 inches. Now both would be respectable heights for the 11th century, but they're hardly anything extraordinary, and I think we can explain the discrepancy between the size of these bones and the supposedly extraordinary height of William I in one of two ways. First, 
Perhaps this bone doesn't really come from William's remains, because let's face it, the chain of evidence for this item is a disaster. There is no way of knowing if the bone Viscount de Falaise received back in 1562 was actually from the Conqueror's tomb, or if that returned by his family in 1742 was the same one. Nor can we be sure that it wasn't interfered with at the time of the Revolution. Alternatively, if it is from William's skeleton, then his height was grossly exaggerated by 17th and 18th century sources. This thigh bone from a 5 foot 6 or 5 foot 10 inch individual could hardly have been four finger lengths longer than that of a tall man in the 16th century, as Charles de Bourgville claimed, and so we have to ask ourselves if we believe his account of seeing an extraordinarily large skeleton, and he wrote that account up several decades after the event, remember, or if we think Sir John Hayward was right on the money when he wrote in 1613 that the dead king was of good stature yet not exceeding the ordinary proportion of men. Visit the Abbey of St Etienne today and you can still see the current marker stone beneath which this femur bone lies. Though whether it will be the last such marker and whether the bone beneath it really does come from William the Conqueror remains to be seen. I'm interested to hear what you think though. Do you believe the femur is likely to be the real deal, or is it a fake? Let me know in the comments below. And thank you as always to those of you who support me over on Patreon, or by making donations to the channel using the thanks button below videos, as your generosity helps me to make this a viable career. If you're interested in hearing more about famous dead people and the sometimes unfortunate things which happen to their corpses, check out my Dead Bodies playlist, which is also linked below for you. I'll be back next week with a new video, and until then, keep learning.